Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Jodcast. Today I've got the usuals with me, Jack, Dan, Russ, obviously myself, Adam. And today we've also got our first ever guest, JB, if you'd like to say hey. Hello, thank you very much for having me. It's nice to be here. I'm a big fan of the, the work that you guys are doing so far. I'm uh, impressed and uh, it's good to be here. It it's is. good to have you here as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So uh, what I'd like to start off to do first is just so our listeners can kind of get to know you a little bit, just know who you are. So this is just going to be like five minutes for you to kind of take the stage, talk about yourself, what kind of things you've got going on, the hustles you're doing, et cetera, et cetera. Nice one. Um, so I'm taking it this episode is going to be like the the Jamie Smith Autobiography. <laughs> no, only five minutes. We don't care that much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have to. I have to say that, like, um, it was a bit of a uh, culture shock. Well, not a culture shock, but like a bit of emotional whiplash when I uh, first found this podcast. Because uh, for those of you that don't know, um, me and Adam, or Welshy, as I, as I know him as, um, we used to like run on the same kind of circuits music-wise. Uh, so when I think of, of Welshy in my mind's eye, I just think of this like really edgy kid with fucking dreadlocks. Uh, and then when I listen to this podcast, and he's coming out with like this really articulate deconstruction of, of like movies as an art form and i'm like oh ooh, someone's been to university <laughs> it's not ooh. much of a it wasn't much of a university to be honest you could barely call it that <laughs> um... no, the, po the point is though is like when i when i uh when i think of you i thought i picture you like screaming obscenities down a microphone and to hear you coming out with like this oh well the, the meaning and i it was it was just really really fucking cool man so i, I, uh, I mean yeah I, I'm, I'm still a really edgy fucking kid it's just i'm on my best behavior <laughs> when i do this and obviously because i'm my best behavior all the time at work as well now so i've kind of had to put the edgy kid away in the closet for a bit oh don't we all yeah. well that's that's part and parcel <laughs> of fucking going legit isn't it i mean i know people from back in the day like a mate of mine he's on his second kid now and it's like fucking hell it's like he's got a big salary and he's a tradesman and everything and i remember fucking dragging him through the snow paralytic drunk making sure i'd like rolling him over to make sure he didn't choke on his own <laughs> fucking sick man so it's like it's part and parcel of growing up in it we've all got to put our edgy kids in a box um <laughs> but now I, I go um i go quite back with uh with Welshy and Dan, and uh, I'm very loudmouthed and opinionated, which is probably why they they asked me to to be on here. So, yeah, that's that's it. That's what I've. Uh, that's what I'm about. You still were uh, with a talker, or have you left them now? I am. I am. I just didn't want to be self-indulgent and plug it. Yeah. Uh, uh, carry on. Uh, no, no, go. Go for it. <laughs> um, I'm the uh, the vocalist of uh, a heavy metal band. Uh, we're called the Tarka. We're a Tarka fish, a Tarka official on all social media. Uh, we've got an album called Sleeping Giant, which is available now on all streaming platforms. So if you like your uh, my favourite genre, angry white man shouts about nothing. If you <laughs> like that genre, go and check that out. Sweet, brilliant stuff. Thank you very much, Jamie. And um, what our plan is when we have guests in the future as well, so what we've done with you too, Jamie. We kind of want our guests to be kind of comfortable about what they're talking about instead of throwing them completely in the deep end. So just like we do with planning to do with all our future guests, we've asked you to prepare for a talking topic. Um, can be about anything you want, but a topic which you wanted to talk about. You did send it to me in the DMs to see what it was. But I'll let you take Slid it forward. In your DMs. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I wanted to discuss video games because we are kind of coming to the end of a, of a new console generation, of an old console generation, so we're coming to that end. And the new one is on, uh, on the horizon. And uh, I kind of get the feeling that we're all, we're all kind of the same age and we were all of that generation that was kind of raised by, by video games. So I just thought it would be fun to sort of talk about our histories with video games, like what consoles we have, what games we like, the state of the industry, video games as an art form, what games we've been playing recently, and just shoot the shit and have a bit of a laugh. Sweet. So, start, start with us. Um, what got you into video games? What's the first video game you remember playing? Oh, mate. Um, 
So I've got sort of vague memories of having a Sega Mega Drive in in my house, uh, which I believe was uh, Sonic the Hedgehog was my first ever proper video game video game. But I could never, I could never beat the uh, the Marble Hill Zone, which I believe was only the second <laughs> second level. I just always remember <laughs> getting stuck in the fire and like dying in the fire, and there was. Uh, you had hazards off screen that you couldn't see like spikes would come out of the wall and things like that so i've got very vague memories of like kicking screaming and shoving things up my bum because i couldn't get past the the second <laughs> uh second stage of sign of the hedgehog so that was my first exposure uh to video games but the uh, the first console that i owned uh was pro probably like a lot of you actually the playstation one and the first game i had for that was a, a game called disney's action game featuring hercules uh which always kind of conf <laughs> absolutely absolutely <laughs> but the thing that confuses me about that is that it's not disney's hercules it's disney's action game featuring hercules yeah. so did they make an action game and then they'd have, fuck it we'll just put hercules in it you know what i mean like are you gonna have more than one <laughs> action game but uh no that is a, a bona fide classic uh, unfortunately i don't know if you've gone back to it but it doesn't hold up as well correct me if uh, i'm wrong but is that the game where the first level's in like uh it's like a side scrolling platforming game but then the that levels, is exactly it. like then the next level is you're running along and then you've got to dodge all this it's like a rail game and you got to dodge everything. yes yeah yeah that's, that's the a, one he knows it he knows i do it. remember that playing was my, that that was my first exposure to to video games like i said it doesn't hold up um, at all now, actually, <laughs> to be fair. It, you, you could, I remember getting stuck on the thing for weeks and weeks and weeks, and you can beat the whole thing in an hour. And I, I don't know whether that's just because when, when you're a kid, everything just seems bigger, doesn't it? Just like time seems to go by so slowly. Um, yeah. But I remember like getting proper frustrated trying to beat the... Um, in the th in the third stage, you fight the first boss of the game, it's a centaur kind of blue yeah so you, you you know the guy i'm talking that. about yeah and i just could not beat him and then my um <laughs> my dad at the time uh was like what does he do in the film and i was like well he jumps on his back so i like my entire family is just around the tv <laughs> sick of hearing me pull my hair out about this i'm about i'm about six years old uh <laughs> and then, then when i when i finally beat did the thing and beat him you would have you would have thought that like the, the, we'd won the world cup or something because like <laughs> my, the entire living room just erupted like yeah <laughs> like, and i'm not sure how much of that was like um thank god he's done it <laughs> yeah <laughs> like now he's gonna shut the fuck up kind of thing. <laughs> as opposed to like actually being proud of me for, for my uh, ability to play a um <laughs> a, a children's 2d side scroller <laughs> but no that's uh that sticks with me. Um, that night does, um, and then and then from there, another another one that got me into gaming was Crash Bandicoot. Oh yeah. And you can't you can't grumble at, uh, at Crash Bandicoot. It's got a, a relatable protagonist because if you boil it down to the base of it, it's a game about jumping over holes and breaking boxes. Now I can't relate to like a Nathan Drake jumping out the back of that plane, but I might need to jump over a hole tomorrow. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And and you never know when you're gonna need to box your way out of a tight situation and break a few boxes. So that is life lessons passed on via Crash Bandicoot. So uh, you no, might I'm have to run away from a giant boulder. You might have to. You might have to do that tomorrow. You know, it's more likely than jumping out the back of a plane. But, I mean, I, I run no. away from a giant boulder every day of my life. It's caused my life problems. So. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never outrun those. You, no. you need to use Heelys. Use Heelys to escape your feelies. Uh, Adam, what about you? Um, see, I was quite fortunate enough to uh, have a Super Nintendo when I was younger, but I got a Super Nintendo as the PlayStation 1 was coming out and the Nintendo 64 was coming out. So it was one of those things of... Normally, I'm a generation behind, but it's just the way it was. It was I got a Super Nintendo as the N64 and PlayStation 1 came out. I got a PlayStation 1 as the PlayStation 2 was coming out, etc., etc. But the first game I ever played was a uh, Zelda Link to the Past. I've got huge fond memories of that because uh, it used to be a thing of like 
It'd be like, you used to always treat like a mini holiday, even though my nan just lived over a road from me when I was young. It was like a special treat to stay overnight at my nan's instead. And I just remember coming back home after staying around my nan's and my mum and dad's like, we've got a Super Nintendo. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> the future is now. And uh, the games we had with it was, which came with it, we had uh, Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. And I think it was called Super Tanukan 2. Um, so oh, it's probably a bunch of pronunciation, but Super Tanankan 2 was a bullshit game because it was a side scrolling shoot 'em up where you play as a robot. And as traditional Nintendo fashion, the game's just bullshittingly difficult because there was no replayability in it. So they just wanted to spend as much time as possible playing it by making it as hard as possible. But um... that seems to be a thing with like a recurring theme with older games. Um, I think a lot of that goes back to maybe like the arcade because it's trying to get you to. You know, spend as much money as you can. Um, yeah. Each time you do a little bit better, a little bit better. But it's uh, yeah, a lot of old games are just punishingly difficult. So. Penny eaters, pretty much. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But, but yeah, uh, Link to the Past is like one of the first games I ever completed as well because it was only back in Super Tanukan, which we owned. So it was the only game I had to play. <laughs> but I remember I have real big fond memories of that. Um, and then when we got. The one thing I'll never forgive my brother for, so if you're listening to this, Luke, fuck you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he, fuck you, Luke. He, he, got a super, he got a Super Nintendo 64. The layout we had when we were younger is like you do when you're young with siblings. We both shared the same bedroom. And traditionally, we had our consoles downstairs. Um so we had our Super Nintendo 64 set up downstairs, which Luke had, I believe it was for his birthday. It was for Christmas, one or the two. Um, we had that for a couple of years. Absolutely brilliant. And then my parents were like, oh, you can actually have another console if you can be in a bedroom if you want. It's a treat. And for Christmas, I got a PlayStation 1. Um, but we brought this PlayStation 1 months before Christmas, only because it was on offer. Um, and my parents did what parents usually used to do back in the day, just to make sure a gift actually works. We were like, okay, you can play on your PlayStation 1 for a couple of hours, just to see that it works in case we need to return it. So I did that. And after playing on it for two hours, my brother was like, I like that. When, when are we going to get it? Probably not for another three months. My brother's birthday is a month before Christmas. So what he did was he traded in his Nintendo 64 mm. and got a PlayStation 1 for his birthday. So then we had a PlayStation 1 downstairs in our dining room and a PlayStation 1 in our bedroom. And at that point, obviously, online or anything like that is fucking pointless. We're sharing the same bedroom anyways. And not in the same wording, because obviously I'd been about 10 or 11 at the time. But I was just like, what the fuck you playing at luke we could have two different consoles to play and now we've got this two of the same console in the same house what's the fucking point <laughs> oh, I, thought, I, yeah. thought that was gonna go in, um, I thought that was gonna go in a different direction when you were setting that up and i thought you were gonna say you know because his birthday just before christmas that your parents gave him your ps1 and i was gonna be like that that's took a very jeremy kyle turn no uh, i i, 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 don't I think got... this is the right platform for this i i would have definitely preferred that because they would still have both a playstation on a nintendo 64. <laughs> There's just no logic having two of the same console in the same house back then. Like no, today, absolutely. it's different. Uh, it's different uh, now. Well, it's obviously N64. all the memory saved on the console itself. But back then, with memory sticks and everything like that, no fucking point. The N64 was a revolutionary console as well. There was oh, some Lord, yeah. fucking amazing I, games I for that console. I I miss it. <sighs> So go on then you two talk to us talk to us about the N64 because we've had a couple of PlayStations. Um, I didn't own an, an N64 when I was a kid, unfortunately. So uh, I'd like to hear some of the obviously you know I've heard of the classics. One knows about GoldenEye, one knows about Mario 64. But uh, you two tell us about your experience with the with the N64. Oh, I didn't play I'd mine. Like, like I remember my mom we had one because my parents wanted one. Well, I think they had it before even I was born. And then I remember my mom dropping it. And then I never got to play it. So they just bought me a PlayStation 1 instead. Or like, a, I can't remember what they bought me. I think it was the PlayStation 1. Because I, I remember my mum dropping it from the loft down into the study. And I, it's one of those memories of a kid that haunts me. That's Ooh. like dropping a kid, that is, man. Yeah. Fucking <laughs> it was just like, I must have been so young. But I just remember it like gambling down. I was like, oh. Ooh. 
There goes my weekend off as a kid away from school. So I never owned an N64, but I used to go around my mates all the time. And like growing yeah. up, they had pretty much every single console. They had the PlayStation One. They had yeah, the N64. Yeah. And then, like, as soon as a new console would come out, it would be like, right, get it, add it to the collection. I feel like we all had a mate like that, like, super yeah. spoil, had every single console yeah. going. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we Got used to go around, and, and yeah. one of the best memories I had of the N64 was playing Pokemon Stadium on multiplayer. Yes, boy. And handing the controller around to each person when it was their turn to attack my fucking creatures. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, one of one of the most mi- like magical moments of my childhood, to be fair, is obviously we all had Pokemon cards. We all doubled in Pokemon oh, cards. Absolutely. I still do. For those watching on YouTube, you can see my giant fucking Pokemon card right here. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> oh, obviously we've lost we all, oh, we've lost us. Yeah, um, yes. Obviously we all did Pokemon cards. I had Pokemon Blue, I believe it was, on the Game Boy Color. Um, so when Pokemon Stadium came out and they had the transfer pack, so you could transfer your Pokemon from your yes. Game Boy cartridge onto the um, Nintendo 64 to play Pokemon Stadium, that blew my fucking mind. I'm like, oh my god, this is the future. This oh, is like, you could, oh, you could put, the future you could put, is now. <laughs> yeah, you could put the the game pack into into the back of the controller, and you could go to the was it the, like, the Game Boy Terror or something? They play the you could play the Game Boy game on the TV, couldn't you? If I remember correctly. Yeah, but the best part was you could play it at double speed. So walking speed, around yeah. there was such a ball ache. <laughs> if, if, if you were good enough, you could unlock Rodrio mode, which was triple speed. So. <laughs> but yeah. No, yeah, uh, absolutely. The, the, had the, um, it had the anime announcer guy as well, Pokemon Stadium. That's what sticks out in my mind. Uh, questionable character models and the announcer guy are two things that stick out in my mind about Pokemon Stadium. I'm really glad you guys brought that up. That's so, so cool. Incredible game. Yeah. yeah. I think and let's not forget, po- what was it, Pokemon Snap as well you had, oh, the camera God, one, yeah. if you ever played that. That's yeah. so good. I'm sure they were going to remake that, or they were going to bring, bring like, make a new there's version. A new, there's a new one. There's a new one coming. We d- we've just got, like, a like a tech demo uh, trailer out at the moment. No yeah, other information. We'll but so. but it's, it's on its way. It's on its way. Nice. It's going to be great. Uh, well, I think my first bit, experience, bit, my, my first experience with games consoles was the same as uh, Adam actually. It was a uh, Super Nintendo, but because I'm a little older, I had time to actually play and appreciate it for what it was. Um, I remember playing. I had a selection of games. Some it, they were like Looney Tunes, but they were kids. Like, I can't remember what it was called. Anyway, you play. I, I, know, I know what you mean. Yeah. I, I remember it because Bugs Bunny was blue for some reason, wasn't he? But it wasn't Bugs Bunny. Yeah. It was like yeah, the child of on. Bugs Bunny and the fucking other bunny or whatever. That whatever. Uh, I remember another <laughs> one, <laughs> Batman Returns for the Super Nintendo. That was fucking nice. Proper like old school side scrolling beat up game where you play as Michael Keaton's Batman and you. Kicking the shit out of clowns on motorbikes. And shit. It was just great. Uh, Super Metroid, which was probably one of my most favourite games. But still, terrified to play it. I think my mum had to play it for me because it was scary. I was scared of that game growing up. Super Metroid, man. Fucking Did you ever play uh, Darkwing Duck? I don't know. I don't think I ever had that many games for the Super Dark- Nintendo. I can't remember what games I actually had. Darkwing Duck was bullshit, man. There was a lot of games. <laughs> it, it builds character playing that game. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, there was a lot no, of I games. Can, I can, There's some uh, games though, as a kid. You just were thinking terrifying. Now as an adult, you're like, how did I find yeah. that game? I, I, I was just about to say used... the exact same thing. Gone. Yeah, like I used to play Republic Commandos. That was like, one of the first games I remember getting for my Xbox. And I think one of the missions where you go for like, one of the hives, is it? Yeah, kid, I found terrifying. Well, you got like the fucking Gene Oceans coming out of you. You're just like, fuck me. They got the light in fucking like, class on that game. Yeah, That's what made it, like, I think. Vietnam War flashbacks. <laughs> See, I missed that. I missed that one because it was an Xbox exclusive. But I heard good things about Republic Commander. I wish, I, wish I could be there. Yeah, 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 no, yeah, I mean, big Star Wars guy. So it holds up. I still play it to this day. 
I bought it on Steam for two quid. It's just worth it. <laughs> it's just uh, such a good game. Did, uh, did any of you guys, that speaking about th like irrational things that scared you as a kid that would just never, ever in your life scare you these days, but did, has anybody heard of Rugrats Search for Reptile? Yes. <laughs> I had that that game. game. <laughs> now, there, there is a section in that game where you are in a toy shop after hours, like like Chucky and Tommy are trapped at the toy shop, and everybody's fucking gone home for the evening. All the workers, it's completely dark in there, and it's like something out of Silent Hill. <laughs> I swear, <laughs> I swear to God, in my in my mind's eye, I can still there's like freaky Jack in the Box um, toys uh, enemies that uh, just pop out of nowhere, and then about halfway through the level, I don't know if any of you remember it. There's this big like purple gorilla that chases you round. I'm like pretty fucking... sure that was the main boss, wasn't it? That was the that what was, was the, the game called. Search for Reptor, Rugrats Search for Reptor. And I, I swear see. to god this this gorilla this gorilla, big purple gorilla, glowing red eyes <laughs> the the inspiration for Capcom to go on and develop the Nemesis from Resident Evil Three, I shit you not boys. <laughs> like absolutely had to be. Like I, I, honestly, I, I, I could probably watch that now and still like tap into that primordial childhood fear. You know what I mean? But that that just scared me absolutely shitless as a kid. Yeah, the, 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 the fucking Rugrats game. game. <laughs> yeah. The only thing from that game which still gives me fucking nightmares is the mini golf levels. Oh, you just took the words. Because there was so fucking shit. Just oh took my God. the words right <laughs> out of my mouth. <laughs> Those mini golf levels are just horrendous. <laughs> fucking terrible. I remember one classic game. I don't know if it's still. I don't know if everyone else played it, but I remember when it came out with the memes. PS, I mean, like the first Harry Potter Philosopher Stone game <laughs> on PS One. That's PS2 actually. Those that's graphics. actually a decent game, but oh, no, yeah, yeah, the graphics are fucking terrible. Actually, to be honest with you, I don't know whether it's a decent game because I've, I've, I haven't gone back to it, but I remember that game being the dog's bollocks when I was a kid. Right? Oh, it, it, it's, it's your classic it? collect them all so platformer, yeah. really. Um, but I remember when I was young and I played it, I found it absolutely amazing because it was like, you obviously watched the movie, then you played the game and you're like, oh, it's like I'm playing the movie. <laughs> but I've seen people playing it looking back now, like Let's Plays and whatnot. And it's just, I... I'm convinced my parents used to feed me drugs for me to think that was good. <laughs> Seriously, there's, there's games that I, in my mind's eye, I can see them as photo realistic, and then I, I look at them now, and it's like, you, you, your imagination really does fill in the blanks when you're a kid, doesn't it, really? Oh, like, no, the thing is, though, we never knew it would be better. Mm. You never, like, when you yeah. play, like, Repub like, I'm playing Republic Commanders now, you, you, this was the pinnacle of how good it was, and now you've got games like Red Dead, where you're like, fuck me, it's almost real. Yeah. That's yeah. that's a game. I mean I mean we'll probably come on to more modern games in a bit, but that's a fucking I, I played I, that's been out for two years and I played it for the first time this year and that is a that's so like good. a it's like a religious experience. Uh, Red Dead Two I'm talking about, not not the original yeah. but the second one. It's like a no, religious Honestly, experience. Jamie, I think both of those games are religious experiences. Yeah. I I latched on first I latched one on so to good. I latched onto Arthur Morgan way more than I latched onto oh, John yeah. Marston. Oh, but, I like, do agree with that. Yeah. I, 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 I did exactly the same. But as works I, of art, I think both of those games, for the time period that first one was released, yeah, is, oh my God, is on so par. good. Yeah, one of the one of the things I keep seeing on uh, Instagram pops up is about some woman in America who sold like pictures from Red Dead to <laughs> I've a seen news store. I've and seen that. Some, yeah, <laughs> Actual, like pictures of some lake yeah. as like a way to show what it was like before pollution, and like the news reporters paid money for it. We're, <laughs> we're, we're all we're all laughing, we're all laughing about that. But I actually work in that industry. I'm a, I I work for a content agency that would uh, get in touch with someone like that to buy the picture. And I'm, t I'm telling you, someone got sacked. So, some one hundred percent, someone lost their job over that. Whoever got whoever got that content signed up and sent it out on the schedule. They got sacked for that. <laughs> so we're laughing, but somebody's on welfare right now. <laughs> I mean, but... sometimes natural selection just takes its place with these people. <laughs> the, th the thing is, though, graphics are getting there. Like, at, yeah. at what po at what point, boys, do you think we'll have like live action? graphics and I'm not I'm not talking about like weird uncanny valley 
slightly off graphic. At what point do you think we'll have like live action graphics in a video game? Like, it's well, gonna be soon. I don't think we will. To be fair, have any? any... Oh, sorry, you came on with. Oh, there is. I want to quickly because I've got a point with that, and I think it's that. I don't think we ever will get to that point because I don't think we all want to. Because it's almost like sorry to bring in films, but it's almost like uh, everyone's watched Rogue One here, haven't they? Yeah. Oh, you're gonna, you're gonna talk Princess... about Tarkin. Yeah, Princess Leia and Tarkin, where it's so realistic. You're like, holy shit, that's them. But your mind still goes, oh, no. And because of that, it makes it look worse, I think. And I think that's what will stop it ever getting to that point, because your mind will be like, oh, no, this is a bit too much. And I think that's what will cause issues for those games. See, but uh, con converse, conversely to that, though, um, with the Star Wars example that you just mentioned, they were, like, trying to bring younger actors, or, or in Peter Cush's case, to bring him back from the dead and completely reconstruct him, but on the flip side of that, you've got the kind of de-aging effect that they do in some of the Marvel movies. Like, if, if you look at Michael Douglas in Ant-Man, when they make him look oh, yeah, yeah. younger, yeah. That's, that's pretty seamless, man. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's, it's not like you're looking and thinking yeah. something's off there. Do you know what I mean? So, so it's... I, it's I kind there. of agree, but I think the thing is, though, when you have games where, like, it's different with a film, but with a game, when you've got that almost realism to say, like, say Red Dead, we use Red Dead. Imagine if it was so realistic mm -hmm. when you shot those uh, bounty hunters, or whatever. You, it was almost quite realistic. I think it creates a bit of an issue. Maybe a psychological I, those, thing there. Those bounty hunters killed my fucking horse, man. They could, I, I would <laughs> shoot them. I want it to be more realistic. You know what I mean? To be fair, you I had, I, feel I had a black and. I had a black and white polka dot horse throughout the whole game called Domino, and I thought I was quite clever, right? Because it was black and white, it was spotted, it, his name was Domino, and he was with me through my entire journey, and I was like three missions from the end, and I got um, I got ambushed by uh, bounty hunters, do you know what I mean? And they killed my horse. Now, ordinarily, you can give them the the revive, the horse medicine, yeah. right? But the... the um, the bounty hunters killed me in the process, and I respawned about half a mile back that way. So I went to where the saddle was on the uh, on the map, and there's a saddle, no horse, right? Oh. <laughs> so these bounty hunters <laughs> fucking killed Domino, and spoiler alert for Red Dead Redemption, but at the final mission, there is a really emotionally poignant touching scene <laughs> where the horse that's been with you throughout your adventure takes an injury and dies and Arthur yeah. leans in and whispers thank you thank you so much and to me it was this random fucking horse that I've known for 20 minutes <laughs> no, <okay. laughs> those, those bastards killed Domino so no Russell no I, no, I do want it to be more realistic you know what I mean <laughs> oh, those bounty hunters need to suffer so like, there's times though you like kill someone and we're dead and you find they've got like a reading ring and you're like oh but no, I can understand that with the horse. Yeah. I was no, lucky I managed to keep my horse alive. The thing is, uh, when we talk about realistic graphics, I think sometimes we are already there. But I think a lot of game designers, for one decision or another, it could be because of what you've said to us, they decide to go with a stylized hint with it. Um, and I'm going to bring us to the Final Fantasy VII remake when it comes to that. I don't know how many of you guys have played it, but the graphics for that is absolutely beautiful. Like, each individual hair on people's heads and faces and everything that is indiv individually um, animated and rendered and everything like that, including fabrics on shirts and everything like that. It's absolutely stunning and realistic, and the only thing... Oh, pardon me. The only thing which stops that game from being photorealistic is the fact that it's stylized. It's got that kind of Japanese anime kind of style to it. And I think that's kind of where we'll be going in the future. Because let's be honest, games is escaping realism. And if you have a game which is going to be photorealistic... You're not escaping realism at that point, are you? Mm. And I think that's where it's going to be now. I think we're going to reach this peak in graphics where we can have the most real-looking thing possible, but designers will choose not to. I think we're way closer with environments in terms of photorealism. Mm. Uh, yeah. character, character models, not so much, but I think environments, uh, you can get pretty close to... 
you, you can get uh, you can get them good enough to sell to a national newspaper. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know I, mean? so. I was having this thought earlier while playing. I was having this thought earlier while playing Cyberpunk actually, and uh, the one How thing. How is that? It's oh, amazing. It's I love um, it. it is amazing, right? And oh, it is. It is. It is actually a really good game. Like the reviews I, I, and stuff I, don't do it justice. Yeah, I'd, I'd like us to go more in depth into Cyberpunk later on because I've, yeah. I've spoken to a few people about it, and we've all agreed the same thing about about this is not just a game; it is an actual piece of art. And it's going to be a lot of talking, so I'd like to hold off Cyberpunk talk till closer to the end. Using it as a quick example, though, with Um, photorealism. Yeah. No. Okay. So with with this photorealism stuff. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) With this photorealism stuff, the one thing that game designers haven't managed to master is uh, like a glass with a (laughs) drinking. Yeah, for water like, looks like shit in every game. Every they can ma- game they can make water look fucking incredible. Red Dead Redemption Two, another example. The water in that looks incredible. But whenever you From drink, distance, yeah, yeah. But whenever you have a drink or something in a container, it looks terrible. And like whenever the pouring of something, yeah. terrible. Yeah, waterfalls. I'm playing Ghost of Tsushima at the moment, and that game is absolutely beautiful. But incredible the game. waterfalls. Yeah, no, it's 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 another one of those um, Red Dead Redemption Two type things for me. Uh, I've I've been quite down in the dumps this year about my mental health and things like that. And I know it sounds really sort of lame, but just walking through the environments in Ghost of Tsushima, I don't know whether it's because it's so serene and relaxing and beautiful, and it's pure escapism. It's it's really been helping me recently. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, but no, yeah, that, like from a distance, these waterfalls. They look incredible, but once as soon as you get close to them, it, like, just in every single game, just water, running water, always looks like shit. And as soon as you you get in it as well and go for a swim, it's it always it just it just never looks quite right. Do you know mm. what I mean? So that's how they get you. What were you going to say? You can swim now in these games. Also, oh, carry on. All I, all I was going to say is I, I'm happy to talk about Cyberpunk, but I'm. Um, I haven't actually received my pre-order yet. There's some shit going on with Royal Mail, so as long as we can keep it relevant, relevant. seriously. As, so as, as you're, not the, you're not the only person to have had oh, that no, problem. Right. So, Jamie, I booked my Thursday and Friday. And Russ has had to live through all of this because I live with him, so he's been witnessing my rage on Thursday and Friday. But um, I booked two days off work because my intention was I was going to oh. black it out in two days, stream it on Twitch and everything as well. And my pre-order didn't even turn up until Saturday. So I could have just not booked that time off work whatsoever. Um, in the end, I just ended up buying it on PC um, on Friday afternoon, evening. And I've now contacted Game. So I finally received my pre-order now. But I've contacted Game going, yeah, I want you to refund it. Because you failed to give me this on release day. I've got my 14-day right to return policy with yeah. all your purchases. Give me my goddamn money. <laughs> they'll, they'll give you the money. I did a similar thing with Last of Us Part Two. Like they'll give you, they'll give you your money back. Yeah. So but, but no, yeah, I'm glad it's it's not only me that it's happened. Uh, happened to I haven't I haven't had it yet. So if we talk about it, just keep it like kind of spoiler free. Free, but I don't mind talking about the mechanics yeah. and stuff. Like, I'm I'm genuinely interested because I've heard a lot of uh, you know on consoles it's not running that great. I've seen a fair few videos of just like cars clipping through the environment and just textures not rendering when you so it's like you've got this faceless guy in a leather jacket in front of you i don't know if you guys have seen that screenshot yes yeah. uh, been making the rounds so, so i it am looked... genuinely interested to know so. yeah. to link it back to harry potter and philosopher's stone there's moments where hagrid in that looks a whole lot more well detailed and textured than some of the character models on the console version of cyberpunk yeah i agree because I've, <laughs> I've, I've, yeah. I've got the console version <laughs> See, I'm lucky because I pre-ordered the console version and I um, originally it was going to be the last game I brought for my PS4 and my PC was still broke when I originally pre-ordered uh, Cyberpunk. Um, but due to this podcast stuff, I got it fixed up because I've been bored with lockdown. I'm like, no, what? it's not going to cost much. So I've upgraded to my PC so I can do streaming. And through all of that, I can now actually run Cyberpunk on high on my PC. Um, so it's like... I've had no problem playing Cyberpunk off my PC, but the PS4 version, I've just left that sealed, and I've seen all the stuff coming out about it on the console version. I'm like, yeah, looks like a game fucking up has helped me dodge a bullet there. <laughs> but that's 
That's funny though, because like you, 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 like even though Dan's got what would be the quote unquote inferior version, you've you've both said that you've come to a consensus that it's a a piece of art. So it's it's kind of interesting that even though it's it's flawed, that it's still like the the content of the game kind of cuts through, kind of thing. Uh, yeah. If if I'm reading that right. The, the thing with me is it's the dialogue as well. The dialogue mm. works really well, and mm -hmm. the interactions in the game work really well. But there are a lot of graphical and rendering issues with the game. I think that is pretty much the only problem with the game. Personally, I think that CD Projekt Red wanted to delay it as long as possible so they could get a maximum release on PS5 and like next gen consoles. Because I think this game will run a hell of a lot better on next gen consoles compared to the current gen. Because it's just. It is beyond belief, like how big the game is as well. It's massive. Well, if, well, that's it. Words in the rumor mill is apparently they did actually want to delay from the December date, but there's too much pressure from shareholders for them to release it on the date it did get released, pretty much. I spoil everything for everyone. Don't I'm also going to hand it to CD Projekt Red because, like, their their past games, being The Witcher, fucking incredible games, like. I'm sorry, but a few graphics and a few bugs here and there aren't going to stop me from enjoying this game. Like, I can happily play it and just carry on. It's just graphics okay. and rendering, but they'll patch that out as soon as possible. So, there was a 50, 50 gigabyte day one patch for PlayStation. And it hasn't really fixed anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's space well spent. That's space with the hard yeah. drive well spent. Yeah, let's move away from Cyberpunk for now, Odie, because I'd like to leave that till uh, yeah. the end. But um, I think it's quite important we talk about gaming as well, because obviously we took, we've all spoke about classic consoles so far, um, and the thing, huge part about classic consoles is obviously a lot of the games were story-driven. You didn't really get much of a multiplayer experience with them, and when it is, when it was, it was all about split-screen, or as we said earlier, about sharing the controller. So multiplayer games, what has been... Either the first multiplayer game or the most definitive multiplayer game of what gave you the best experience that you ever done. We'll start with you first, Jamie. Left for Dead, yo. Yes. I, I, as, as, as far as as soon as you say multiplayer, for a lot of people would be like Halo, Call of Duty, that Left for Dead for me. Like in that game, when you when you play it in the in the story, you can kind of run and gun it because the. Um, the AI will kind of keep up with you and their dead shots and whatever, and they're, they're programmed to look at look out for you. But when you play it with real people, you guys have to work together as a unit. You know what I mean? You have to be like this <clears throat> fucking fa phalanx movement kind of tight-knit group talking to each other, strategizing, because especially on the higher difficulty levels, those zombies will rip you to pieces first chance they get. And if you get separated from, from the group, you're dead. You know, so like... No, nah, yeah, Left for Dead, definitely Left for Dead. I, I, I mean, for, for the overall package of, of the game, there's there's not it's very bare bones. Do you know what I mean? But for a multiplayer experience, you know, you can you can keep your Halos, you can keep your Fortnite. Left Left for Dead all the way for me. Yeah. Oh, that's it. It's all about Left for Dead too. When you go through the uh, fairground level, and you'd always get one dickhead who decided they want to do gnome ski without telling anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was usually me. <laughs> well, fuck you, this, man. <laughs> if you're listening to this and you think, oh, I didn't run anybody like that in my crew we play Left 4 Dead, it's fucking you, mate. So <laughs> The thing with Left 4 Dead is the game is it's an extremely satisfying game to play, either as survivors or zombies. Like I forgot about the zombie mode, yes. Left 4 Dead 2, if you're like playing versus mode where you've got a team of zombies which are played by people and then you've got a team of the survivors which are played by people and say you get through so many gates on the circus mission, if you remember that, when you're on the circus, yeah. and a jockey comes around the corner and fucking takes you straight back to the beginning of the level. That jockey player must yeah. be the most yeah. satisfied person on the planet at that time. Because it is satisfying. To... That jockey to... player gets all the pussy, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, enough poo. Enough poo. <laughs> I used to, I used to like, um, find the witch and position myself either as like a hunter or a charger and position myself in front of the witch. And as soon as the, the player controlled um, 
survivors will see you they'll shoot at you but in the pro in the process of killing you they start all the witch do you know what i mean and, yeah. and on the on the higher difficulty levels that thing will fuck you up no end do you know what i mean so that was that was a uh, that was a cool tactic i discovered from uh, from playing as the zombies and also when you coordinate and one of you is um one of you playing as the smoker and the other one's playing as the spitter so the smoker would be able to like incapacitate and drag a survivor and then the spitter would make a pool of acid that damages uh, the player. So if if you were able to incapacitate them and hold them in one position, and then they get spit on, they would they would be instantly incapacitated. So it's all sorts of stuff. That you boomer can strategies do, but... as well, man. Just like... just in case anyone's interested, there is still a massive Left for Dead Two community on PC. Like if you ever want to play online, there's the servers on there are still absolutely buzzing. And they've now added all the maps from Left for Dead One onto Left for Dead Two as well. Oh, that's sweet. I think I've yeah. got Left 4 Dead 2 as well. They're actually so bringing out, there's a so... new game coming out soon. It's not Left 4 Dead, but it is the same premise. Like, yeah, it's Vermin just... Tide. Yeah, it's already come out, I... man. What's that? Uh... I said Vermin Tide. It's no, 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 no. It's <laughs> oh, no, zombies no. and humans, not Warhammer. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's called Back for Blood, and it's, That's developed the one. By, it's developed by Turtle Rock Studios that made the original Left 4 Dead. Um, oh, right, so... okay. Basically, Valve isn't putting out Left 4 Dead 3, so Turtle Rock said, okay, fine, we'll do it. So it's, it's got a lot of elements of Left 4 Dead, you know, four survivors, hordes of infected, uh, special infected with with different kinds of abilities, but it's not Left 4 Dead. You know, it looks like Left 4 Dead, but due to international copyright laws, yeah. it's not. Still, we <laughs> shall enjoy it like it is Left 4 Dead, oh, yes. though it isn't. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Anybody else for multiplayer? World of Warcraft for me. Like... I have played World of Warcraft now for 15 years. Uh, I've played through every expansion from day... Well, f not pretty much from day one, but I have played through vanilla as well. Uh, the fact that it's just a community of people banding together to either kill each other in PvP or to take down some pretty nifty uh, raid bosses with pretty interesting mechanics is... It's just one of them games that just grabs me, man. Uh, I've currently got I've currently got two level sixties uh, in the new Shadowlands expansion pack. Uh, I've got like twelve of the characters to level from level fifty to sixty because <laughs> of the level squish. But no, it's just one of them. It, the law there's a lot of law surrounding it as well, and that's very much like what I'm into, um, like the PVE element. And playing with other people and doing dungeons and shit. It's just one of them. Yeah. See, with World of Warcraft, I could just never get into it. I've, I've tried four times now and I just can't get into it. But when it comes to MMORPGs, the definitive one for me, and anyone who watches me streaming will know because we've been, I've been playing it recently on the streams because the server's still open for it, is uh, Guild Wars 1. For me, that was like the MMORPG. And even today, Graphic wise, obviously, doesn't hold up, but gameplay wise and everything, it's great. And what made it so great is, especially at the time it came out, I think it came out in 2006, um, it was one of the few MMORPGs which wasn't trying to be a World of Warcraft clone. It was trying to be its own thing, and it did it well. Because it's, it's my issue I find with a lot of MMORPGs today, including Guild Wars 2, because Guild Wars 2 fell into the trap. They just try to copy World of Warcraft, and as much as I don't like World of Warcraft, World of Warcraft does World of Warcraft the best. Any other game which have tried to replicate that magic, yeah, it can be good, yeah, it's a good system, but it just feels like you're playing reskinned World of Warcraft. Yeah. The only exception to that of a decent World of Warcraft clone I've played is uh, Final Fantasy XIV, which is the online multiplayer one they did. Because it has taken a lot of elements from World of Warcraft, but they've done loads of extra things themselves to spice it up and make it different. So it's one of those things of if you are a hardcore WoW player, you'll go in and you'll recognize a lot of mechanics and everything straight away. But there's going to be loads of new things you need to explore and learn at the same time. So Final Fantasy XIV for that, an absolutely brilliant job. But um, with MORPGs, for me, it'll always be the first Guild Wars. Absolutely phenomenal game. And same things like Dan said. Amazing story, amazing deep lore. 
amazing setting they build an actual world which you actually feel like you're a part of and you're having an impact on it without it making you feel like call of duty hero syndrome where the whole entire world revolves around you they able to make sure that's not going on um it's free to play i believe i know you don't pay subscriptions for it but if anyone's ever interested guild wars one i believe it's free to play these days uh, but citation needed on that i think it's always been free to play it's always been not needed for subscription. There's never been a subscription. But you did have to buy the core games. Yeah. You still had to pay for the core games. Ah, but is is it free to play, pay to win, or can you kind of play for free and just? It's, it's play for free, and anything you pay for, I think, is just purely cosmetic. That's the best way to do it. Yeah, that's yep. the best way to do it in anything. I think it's always has 100%. been. Like these loot boxes and shit can get fucked. <laughs> <laughs> is it, yeah it's fair loot boxes can get fucked but i'll be honest when i used to be hardcore into playing overwatch when you got a loot box it is all aesthetics it wasn't anything game breaking so you know it wasn't too bad but the moment you got a loot box drop that shit was hype <laughs> it was amazing and if you got a legendary skin out of that loot box if you was on team chat with your mates you just absolutely lose your shit it was great I think loot boxes, there is a time and place and the way to do them, to be honest. I have to stay away from them and uh, microtransactions as a whole, if it, especially if it's in a game that I like because I've got quite an addictive personality. Like I, I <laughs> hardcore fell in love with the, uh, with the Crash Team Racing remake and um, they added the ability to buy uh, the game's currency, which is one per coins that you use it to unlock things in uh, what they call the pit stop to... Uh, unlock again like you said it's, it's all cosmetic it's nothing that's game breaking to help you win the game um but the way that the shop works is that there's, there's only a set amount of items there at one time and you have to buy them to reveal new items so it's not like you can scroll through and just buy the thing you want so if you've been looking for a skin that you really want for a certain character in um in this pit stop and it's not there and then you see it it's like well i could now grind and play five, six, seven races until I've got enough coins or I could spend four ninety nine over there and, and, and buy it. But it's a fucking slippery yeah. slope because you buy that and then the next thing you want comes on. So I, I have to be very, very careful with uh, with my micro, microtransactions. So I just try and stay away from, from games I, that have them. Really. I was but like four games, the four guys did... Four guys did something similar to that, Jamie, for her entire thing of there's only fixed amount of items you can purchase once every two days and the uh, cosmetic shop recycles. So if you ain't got the coins to buy it there and then, you don't know when the next time's going to be for you to buy it. Like, lucky enough, I don't care too much about cosmetics when it comes to games, uh, such as Four Guys. Uh, it's different when it comes to something like Guild Wars, which used to always fucking hurt me, because in Guild Wars 2, they do do cosmetic uh, microtransactions, and you get some six seasonal pieces of gear, which would work out once you've paid for all the in-game currency. You're looking at twelve pounds to buy a set of cosmetic armor. But a small part of me is like, but it do be looking sick though. <laughs> kind of want it. <laughs> it do be. It do be. That's, that's like when me. Remember, Ad, we used to play Call of Duty World War Two, and we got yeah. the new outfits. But like I liked what Call of Duty World War Two did. I know that there's a, I know Call of Duty World War Two came out at that time with Battlefront Two, when there was the whole, popper like ah, oh, you want to do anything in our games, spend money. Yeah. But I know obviously Battlefield Two. Well, we could go into that later. To be fair, that whole transaction thing. But like Call of Duty did something really cool because like me and Adam both wanted these same outfits like Boogie Boys, and like you could get them, you could pay money for them. Or you could actually just spend time in game and actually unlock them. And I noticed a lot of things did start have moved towards that now. Very rarely. Yeah. Well, I say very rarely. Well, that's it. We spent like 20, 10 years old. So I don't know if they do loot boxes as often anymore. Well, that's it. We grinded so many hours just to get the in game currency to buy those Hawaiian shirts so we can dress up but as boo boys. Is, it was so fucking worth it. Uh, <laughs> that was the mean. It was worth it because those games were actually fun. It never at any point did it really go because we bought the map pack straight away, didn't we? Yeah, like, that's it. It was it, it was, it was free on like, the PlayStation yeah. Four games, wasn't it? We yeah, but free it never felt games. bad. Yeah, it was never one of those games where it's like, oh, this is a bit much. It's too much money. This is. Anyways, I'm gonna quickly well, disappear for enjoyed. a moment because I need to grab a beer. So I'll be right back. Okay. I've got a great topic for when uh, for when Adam comes back.
Uh, I miss Adam. <laughs> you live in the same city? <laughs> I've never seen it. <laughs> I've never seen him. I was I was gonna go to a gig with him, and then I was like, you know what? Actually, I'm a bit tired. I'll get the next one. I did not know. I did not know that there ain't gonna be a next one for the foreseeable. Jay, do you, you want to go to this gig tonight, son? Because there ain't gonna be no gigs. <laughs> well, that was it. Like Dan and Jack were meant to come down here, and I, and that was uh, in November when after we come out of the lockdown, I was like, oh, we'll come down. There's like, oh no, lockdown part two. Yeah. This lockdown's getting uh, everyone, I think. I'm fed up it, with is, it, it is yeah, what it is. Like, we I, I know we can't go too... Uh, we, we probably shouldn't go too deep into it because of the, the nature of the politics. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It is what it is. It'll get there when it gets there. But the, po the point is, uh, the point is, no, I haven't seen Welshie. For all I know, he's lying about living in Bristol. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but... He's not. Sadly, he lives with me. <laughs> for, well, for all I know, you could be in cahoots. Oh, I would happily be out of Bristol. I could pay less money. <laughs> it's expensive city. It's a fuck. It. It's a fucking nightmare. It's the only thing I hate about this city. Just what how price? much money it is to live anywhere. Yeah, just how expensive it all is. That's just what happens mm. when you go further south. <laughs> Do you know what though? I, I know. I know it's not <laughs> dovetailing into a separate topic here, but <laughs> I, I've I've great. I've gained a yeah, new appreciation for the UK since moving south. Like I'm I'm much closer to all sorts of beaches and all sorts of little beauty spots that I just yeah, wasn't. It's sort a of like, lot nicer. No, it's it's lovely. When you're trapped in the so centre of done, when you're trapped in the centre of the country like I am, oh mate, like I'd never it's go back. I, I love, I, I'm very proud of where I've come from. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. I would never go back. I wouldn't want to live in the black country again. Do you know what I mean? But you don't, you don't know what no. you're to be out of the black country. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like it's very in the middle of everything, surrounded by urban, and you have to go for yeah. miles to see so to see a, anything. Well, me green. and I think... <laughs> Me and Adam have said that many two times. So when you move down here, you don't ever really want to move back. Like, I'd, like, no I'd, matter how I'd shit miss, like, gets, you don't want to leave. I'd miss battered chips too much. <laughs> do, you, do, you know, do you know what? Yeah, yeah, I do. Well, Look, I know a place, and I only know the place because our housemate is uh, the chef there, which does battered chips in Bristol. <laughs> Yeah, better. You better not be joking. Don't no, no, do that. I'm not. I'm don't, not. Don't dangle um, the dream and take he, it away. He, he, he works at a like nerd bar place, pretty much. Um, they serve food and yeah, everything, and like there. games and everything. He's the chef there, and he's from the black country like us. So uh, he's got them as a special for that place to uh, add orange chips, battered chips on. Sweet. Right, while back you to were, topic. While you were gone, yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. I was, I was just going to say, while you, while you were gone, we were talking about how we live in the same city, but I've never seen you. For all I know, you could be lying. So we should, uh, we, we should go, we should go and have some, some battered chips. Yeah, one of the well, we, well, when... we, we, we keep saying we we're going to meet up, do we? When you moved down, but then the, uh, the COVID pandemic happened, that's and it's exactly, just not happened. That's exactly what I just, <laughs> that's exactly what I said. I was going to go to that gig with you, and then I was like, you know what, I'm tired, I'll get the next one, and there, and there just wasn't a next one. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I've got a question for you all about games. Hit me with it, boss. So, obviously, games have certain mechanics. Um, what is the one mechanic in a game that you truly, like, appreciated like you thought what the hell that is amazing oh yeah i've got one uh, so um like i said earlier recently i've been playing through uh, ghost of tsushima and i love the way that that game does traversal because usually the um when you play especially when you play an open world game and there's all sorts of you know place markers and mission markers and your, your screen's just full full of shit and like stats and where you've got to go it's not like that when in ghost of tsushima what they do is um they implement a mechanic that's called the guiding wind so you can drop your pin on the map to where you want to go and as long as you're sort of traveling in the direction that the wind's blowing you go in the right way and it's and then the whole screen then is just filled with your character and the environment and the the ui only comes back into into play um when the game cannot can tell all right you take the piss to get in now here's, here's where you've got to go and it gives you a little orange marker or when you're in combat but aside from that 
Um, it's just full blown, like I said, just the character model and the environment, and I, I'm I love that. And to get to certain secret places or places that are kind of not telegraphed exactly where they are, there'll be stuff like um, okay, so there's there's a side quest where you can follow the foxes, um, and you find little little Inari shrines, and that helps you sort of progress in a certain skill tree. Um, there's another mechanic where there'll be tufts of smoke on the horizon, so if you wanted to investigate that, obviously somebody's got a campfire on or something's on fire, so the way that Ghost of Tsushima does traversal as opposed to a fable where you're following a golden path or a Skyrim where there's just markers everywhere, I definitely think more games need to look at what Ghost of Tsushima did there and pay attention to it. I'm, I'm in love with it. It's brilliant. It's, it's something which um, Cyberpunk does quite well, actually, um, because I, I agree with what, you, what you're saying there. Off, more than often than not, the UI of the game does break that immersion. Mm-hmm. And having that wind telling you which direction you're meant to be going is brilliant because it just makes it feel like it's a natural part of the environment, but you still have that way to know where you're going. And I think Cyberpunk's done it in the brilliant way of your UI instead is incredibly overwhelming, but it's over incredibly overwhelming in general because obviously you are playing with someone who has a computer for a brain and you do have mechanical eyes which would have all these different overlays going on helping you process all that information and it's like the total opposite of ghosts which you've just mentioned but still working in an amazing way where the ui is making it immersive by making it so cluttered and complex like you'd imagine being a cyborg would be and I'd it's say it's I'd kind be... of like the the total polar opposite of um, where immer- more immersion in in Ghost of Tsushima would be for you to be able to appreciate these vast environments, and more immersion in Cyberpunk is for you to really like get into your character's kind of mind frame. Because like like you said, if he's if he's got a computer for a brain, and the, so so even though it's super cluttered with information, it's still it's sort of like the the polar opposite version of immersion, but they're both kind of working together. I like that. I like yeah. That. That's it. I think I, it's for me when I'm playing video games. Immersion is probably like the most important thing. I know there's loads of memes out there all the time. Like, oh my, my, my immersion, you're breaking my immersion. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but for me, immersion is important when it comes to a game because you are playing. You're meant to be playing in a living world, so you want to be able to be invested and feel like you're part of that world. And when you've got something which is stopping you from having that immersion, to me, it kind of ruins the game. I'll tell you mine. Um, it's technically, in a sense, breaking the fourth wall because PlayStation 1, I'm just going to say, PlayStation 1, Metal Gear Solid, Psycho Mantis boss fight. Yes. <laughs> that is a brilliant mechanic. That is an absolutely brilliant mechanic. Probably yes. the most genius mechanic. Uh, that game in general, actually, was probably just a genius game. I, I recall there being uh, a part in that game where you had to get like a key code or something for a door. And it wasn't in the game. It was on the back of the video game case. It was a codec. Uh, it was a special codec signal you needed to use to call someone. It was on the back of a case. I remember that. Yeah. And that Psycho Mantis boss fight, like, you cannot beat it. And then the you find out he... you have to switch the controller into the second port. And he reads your memory card, telling you what games say, you've played. Fact he reads a memory you're, card. You're no. a fan of Spyro the Dragon, aren't you? And I'm there <laughs> now, you're like, oh, fuck that! Fuck that, I'll play it later! Dad! 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 Yeah. <laughs> When, when, I first played, when I first played it and it got to that part and it started reading off my save files, I'm like, I'm not okay with this. What's going on? <laughs> Such a great mechanic. Like, oh my god. Like he read your um controller movements, didn't he, if you were plugged into controller port one. Yeah. So he would always counter you. So the way yeah. to get round it was to take the controller and put it in the second port and then you'd be able to fight him and beat him. Just incredible. (laughs) Like, something so simple, but like, for PlayStation 1 as well, that's like early fucking generation. 
Incredible. So he, an another, he's another. full blown ahead of it though, isn't he? Uh, Coach Kojima, who makes yeah. those games, he's like always with every game he's done. He's kind of always tried to be a little bit like that. Not always to the effect of Psycho Mantis, because like th like you just said, that that goes down in history as one of the all time greatest kinds of twisty mechanics. But he's always kind of trying to to push the boat out. He's a, he's a very meta creator in in that sense. He kind of walks in both worlds, as it were, do you know what I mean? So. Yeah. Just one game, so, actually, that I haven't but, played yet, being talking about Kojima, is, uh, Death, is Death Stranding. Haven't played it. It looks oh, too weird. Walking Simulator. Walking Simulator, yeah. I've not yeah. heard lots of things about that. D delivery but, uh, Simulator. <laughs> bringing no, it back I, to I, Metal Gear Solid, uh, Metal Gear Solid 3, Snake Eater. One of the most memorable moments of that is, if you remember the end, the old man who's a sniper, um i didn't know this was a thing until years after i thought it's what naturally happened but the, what stands out is so important for me with that was just before the boss fight of the end i saved and left it because i was going on holiday so i left for a week and was able to play it for a week and when i came back to play it he was already dead and he did this whole entire thing of oh he died at old age you you took too long i was like well what the hell's going on here what what the hell being scabbed out of a boss fight it turned out um i remember reading it in the playstation <laughs> plus magazine where it was called back then um the game because obviously playstation 2 kept track of your time didn't it the time of day and everything like that and if you started to play it seven days after the last time you saved just before you go to fight the end it has it so uh, the end dies from old age and you just skip the whole entire boss fight. <laughs> I didn't know that. That is that's that's so good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fucking God, they're so edgy. Like yeah. Metal but, Gear like, games. At, like yeah, at just... the time, I, I just thought that's what was meant to happen anyway. So I thought nothing of it. And it wasn't until I read of it, I was like, you fucking what? I've missed a whole entire <laughs> boss fight. I'm pissed. You got robbed. Fuck. <laughs> Oh, now, the man. thing about Metal Gear Solid 3 that sticks out for me is going up the ladder with the theme. That's, oh. a, that's a, bit, it's a big ladder, but that's like a proper proper moment in that game, man. Love yeah. it. Do you have a, a, a mechanic, Russell and Jack? Because I haven't really heard. We've been sort of chatting endlessly, and these guys have very patiently been waiting. So I want to hear their mechanic. Okay, Jack, go first. I think Jack's froze. <laughs> <laughs> he's just staring at the screen. He's, he's died of old. He's died of old age. We've it too long. <laughs> skipped his boss first. Oh, there he is. He's back. He's back. He's back. Back from the dead. Got the D right, on him. I'll put my, hang on. If I put my keyboard in the other port, we'll be able to get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, my favourite mechanic, I'd say, would probably be... I, I'm very easily pleased than I was as a kid. So, uh, my favourite game was Dragon Quest, Dragon Quest Eight, Journey of the Cursed King. And I loved the uh, alchemy pot in that. I loved just crafting things. I, I thought it was amazing. That was That's, that's my, probably my favourite mechanic to date. Sweet. I remember the Dragon Quest games. Again. Before I think of mechanic... Sorry, I was just going to say I've never played the Dragon Quest games, but craft crafting in general, um, I like as a mechanic, especially in like open world games and Far Cry games and Assassin's Creed games and stuff like that. Go on, Russell. Oh, uh, one of the me game mechanics I really like that games seem to stop, have stopped doing, but were like big. And it's only come to my mind because I'm playing Republic Commanders now. Is squad commanding? Is like war games where you get to play as a sergeant. It's in a Call of Duty, always angered me. But there was a game that I can't remember what it was that allowed it, and it was you. Act, it was basically you got to command your squad, so you got to give them missions and got to give them ways to fight, and it actually felt like you was being tactical, and it made sense because it was like, oh, if you do a bad strategy and your guys fuck up, I think it was Brothers in Arms, Hill to Hell. Yeah, it was one of the first Brothers games I played that had that, like. Highway to Hill, whatever it was called. Uh, it was wasn't it whole... Road to Hill 313 or something stupid? I think so, something like that. But Hill 13, I thought that was what, Vietnam War. But anyway, um, but it was just brilliant because it was just that whole, you've got a squad, you need to organise them. If you do a bad strategy, because I always remember, I think it was the Brothers in Arms game where, 
and where if you did a bad strategy, like it doesn't, it penalizes you by basically just saying you fucked up, you've killed your entire squad. This is on you. And you're like, fuck. Yeah, it was uh, Brothers in Arms Road to Hill Thirty. Ah. But games seem to have gone away from that now. You never really get like games with, which are like squad based. That first person to shoot it. I think the last squad based game I played like that was actually the re-release of Freedom Fighters on GOG. Freedom Fighters for the PlayStation Two was my favourite game. Like PlayStation Two game, incredible, and. Um, you played this guy where basically the communists invaded America. <laughs> it was the Red Dawn of PlayStation 2. If you've seen the Red Dawn film. Yeah. Wolverines! <laughs> so those are some good like, things you could have. But games, sometimes I do feel like this might just be me being a bit of a, a member berry fan and loving old school games. Is I do feel games now push so much into being this like surreal experience where it's like, oh, look at how real this is. If you don't sleep, you die and shit like that. But it just takes it away from just being able to have like immerse yourself for like an hour or so in a game that you can just forget about. You don't have to do real world responsibilities. It's what I liked about. I think it was as much as Fallout 4 was a bit controversial. I might have been New Vegas actually, where if you played survival, you had to do all that stuff. Like you had to eat, sleep, and drink. Whereas you could just play normal and just have a good time. Oh, that's it. It's like, except for Cyberpunk, I'd say over the last year or two, the only games I've really properly enjoyed, which would be like new releases, is Red Dead 2, Kingdom Hearts 3. And the Final Fantasy VII Remake. And I'll throw Nier Automata in there as well. Even though Nier Automata came out years ago. Only because I only finally got to play it last, uh, last year. It was. Yeah, it was last year. Um, and all of them are just amazingly, amazing, immersive, story-driven games. Which get rid of all these horrible, boring details. Like Nier Automata is a bloody amazing bit in that. Because in Nier Automata, you're playing as an android. And how your upgrade system works is you change all the different chips and drivers as part of your system. And uh, there's an actual System 32 chip in there. And you can choose to remove it. And if you remove it, you get game over. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. That's good. Um, but yeah, it's like, oddly enough, all those games I named just except for Red Dead Redemption is... Uh, Japanese, so that probably says more about me being a weeb than Fucking anything weeb. else. I think they're all from the same studio as well, actually, Square Enix. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, f I find a lot of new games recently just very lacklustre. I feel like games are too try trying too hard to have this kind of like uh, prestige to it instead of give delivering a good product. They don't want to be a good product. They just want that prestige which comes with the idea of a good product, if that makes sense. I feel well, like game of... developers also follow fads as well, like trends. Like do you want quick... Yeah, go on, Russ. I just want to quickly interrupt just because this is Adam's point. Sorry, Dan. No, no, go go for it. Um, but with what Adam has said there, but this is, I think that links back to what uh, Jamie was saying earlier about graphics. It's because of how games now, they are so like, oh my God, fan wanking of how great these graphics look. You can see this anime titty is so realistic. <laughs> oh my God. But it's just to hide away from how shit the games are sometimes. Well, like well, it just, it's, it's almost all, like... All you do... style, no substance. Yeah, yeah, I feel like that's another big thing that happens a lot where it's just like, oh, look at how sick this is. Then you you play it and you're like, oh, there's fuck all here. It looks pretty, but there's fuck all. Well, well that's, that's what made Kingdom Hearts 3 so good because the graphic style of Kingdom Hearts 3 is like most modern Disney movies and like the cuts like the, with that part of the game where you go to the snow planet where Elsa is and everything like that they obviously do the whole entire iconic fucking um, let it go scene oh, and they've not put the scene from the movie in they've completely rendered it and remade it within the game 
and like the amount of detail just surpasses what they did in the original film and it's just amazing and beautiful and i think it just looks so amazing and beautiful because they're not trying to make it look realistic it's because as i said earlier they've got a style to it and it's like how do we optimize our style with this new graphical technology they don't care about the realism or anything like that it's just what can, what can we play around with and what unique things can we do with this new technology mm -hmm. and i think that's the reason why things like kingdom hearts and final fantasy for me although they're graphically amazing the graphics don't really add or take away from it as per se because they've still shipped in a brilliant product they've still shipped a brilliant game the amazing graphics is just an added extra. Yeah. Uh, what I was going to say all... is... Sorry. No, go on, John. Sorry. I was, I was, very quickly, all I was going to say is those games will stand the test of time as well because they've got a, a more uh, defined art style rather than going for uh, hyper-realism because uh, you can look back on games that came out in like 2013 and they already look dated, you know what I mean? So, But the games, like I think the original Kingdom Hearts still holds up graphically mm. because it's so stylized and... Uh, there's games like Ultimate Spider-Man for the PlayStation 2. It's it's cell shaded, and you could put that next to a, a shell shaded game for a, from this year, and it, it still looks not just as good, but it, it stands the test of time way more than any other game, or most of the games, sorry, of that era. Do you know what I mean? So oh. yeah. Well, it's like you go with something as simple as say, let's go Worms. Worms is an old ancient game, but the style in worms is so unique and amazing it's what 20 plus years old that game and you can still go back and play and go know what these graphics are stunning and it's not because they're yep. stunning because they're so high res or anything like that it's stunning because it's such a unique style which holds to the test of time mm, i feel like the more the more you try to be cutting edge for now the more you're going to date your product in the long run but uh yeah, yeah. it's like i was Sorry, gonna, I was gonna say about developers following like fads and trends like, at the moment, game trends seem to be hovering around uh, looter shooters and survival simulators. Like, mm. there's not really that much originality, and there's a new survival sim coming out every other week. And it's just like, which one's going to be the best one? It's like them all competing, and it, again, I think it just dilutes. Do you uh, remember back in 2010 when it was all about zombies? Yeah, oh, but yeah. Left 4 Dead started that. Yeah. Left 4 like, Dead did start that trend. Uh, and, yeah. Well, it's like Battle Royale now. You can, I think these trends you can pinpoint to one game every time. Like Fortnite is your battle trends and all shit like that. Yeah. Like, and stuff like that. Like Again, Left 4 Dead like, caused the zombies. Yeah, MMORPGs, World of Warcraft being one of the original ones. Like, you know, like they've all got the starting... It's like Patient Zero. <laughs> <laughs> of the certain games like, what would the survival sim be um, well with your games I think that's just the same as society though because you get it with films that's just not that's not like unique to games that is yeah. with everything that is or, film, or media you get with music as well yeah, and then, but you, then you get your, you get your triple A releases then that are like completely different from the rest or feel completely different from the rest I suppose it's down to, I suppose it's down to marketing at the end of the day at the end of the day because mm -hmm. like Cyberpunk, another example with Cyberpunk, how long have we been looking forward to this game? Like the hype surrounding this game has been fucking staggering. Like I've been in the car with my mum today and probably heard about six, seven Cyberpunk adverts on the radio. It is constant. It's all I'm talking about, it's all anybody's talking about. You do get it with big games like that, though. Like yeah. Skyrim was the same, GTA yeah. Five. They were like when they first come out, fucking everywhere. Mm. Skyrim had a really good release date as well from a marketing standpoint because it was yeah. 11, 11, 11. And it's like that's what beautiful, monumental. Yeah. Once in a once in a generation. Yeah, you just painfully. You've painfully reminded me it came out nine years ago as well now. Now I feel like it was just shit. <laughs> it, it, doesn't feel, it doesn't feel that long because every, every fucking week it feels like Todd Howard gets out of his cryogenic fucking <laughs> chamber where he sleeps upside down like a bat and announces super arcade hyper multi-edition Skyrim and Knuckles for the PlayStation 54. Do you know what I mean? So no. we'll, we'll, be, we'll be playing that game until we're fucking dead, lads. Elder Scrolls 6 is a lie. Yeah. It's, it's no. just Skyrim again. I am no, surprised. Jamie, Jamie, what PS4. would you do, Jamie, if you took the COVID vaccine and then 
after you took the, the COVID the vaccine, <laughs> you wake up in the wagon. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only way I'm going to take it. If that's how it happens, that's the only way I'm taking that vaccine. Uh, hey, wanna, you're finally awake. Be, I want to be the cat. That's that's my that's my condition. If I'm going to wake up in that wagon, I want to be the cat. <laughs> you want to be a Khajiit? Oh, I no. has coins if you has wares. <laughs> okay, furry. Let's move on. <laughs> you talk, you fucking weeb. Do you know what I mean? We should fall on a I want to fuck 2D women, not animals. Come on, man. <laughs> oh, man. <Yeah. laughs> No, going back to what you were what you were saying, like um, I th I'm I'm in quite a good position in terms of like the the modern gaming market because it kind of appeals to my sensibilities in a way because there's a lot of strong kind of single player games coming out. I'm, I don't really fuck around with multiplayer too much. Um, I haven't I haven't got the temperament for it, and I haven't got the the skill. To, the, sorry, I haven't got the time and resources available to me to invest that much time in in a game to get to get good, as it were. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I like the the sort of single player uh, cinematic games that are coming out at, at the moment. Uh, mentioned Ghost of Tsushima to death, uh, Red Dead Redemption Two, the the latest God of War was dope. Spider Man was dope. Um, until dawn was pretty fantastic that was single player as well but at the same time as you've got these single player experiences you've also kind of got the resurgence of the of the 90s mascot platformer kind of coming back now like everybody's like fucking crash bandicoot and spyro and um that they're kind of back in the public consciousness now and there's a lot of indie developed platformers that are out there and it just sort of appeals to my you, you know, like everything should stay the same way as it was in my fucking childhood, and I'm not hearing anything else about it. Do you know what I mean? So it kind of, yeah. kind of appeals to me in, in that way. So I mean, it could um, explain a lot about Nintendo players then, since they've never lost those mascots and they still act like the five. So <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> to me, to me, Nintendo could almost be its own topic for a podcast because you, oh you've definitely got, you've, got oh, gaming, yeah. you've got gaming in general and industry trends and everything that we've talked about innovation classic games or whatever and then you've got nintendo over here that's always done its own fucking thing yeah. do, you, do you know what i mean so yeah. we, we could have i mean a, I mean, yeah. disclaimer, I do actually really enjoy Nintendo games and Nintendo <laughs> products, but it's just so fucking easy and so fun to rip into Nintendo fans. It's more of a mercy killing than anything. But... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I, I've, uh, I've never really dipped my toe too much into Nintendo's IPs. I've only ever, I've, I've owned all the Nintendo handhelds, Game Boy, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, DS, 3DS and Switch, but they've all only ever been pokemon playing devices yeah. i've only yeah. ever brought pokemon for him yeah uh and i had my um my best mate actually he, he lives in um he lives in dudley I, I miss him a lot actually but uh he's got a switch and he recently told me that you're wasting your switch by just playing pokemon on it because there's so many games for it so when i when i've got the cash and the time i might invest in a bit more nintendo stuff because I, I know there's a loads of fucking Breath of, Breath of the Wild. Um, I've played I've heard, it. Yeah. I've played it very briefly. I think I've only played it for about two hours. But those two hours alone got me in love with that game. And one of the only reasons I ever consider um, getting a Twitch um, is just so I can play Breath of the Wild, really, or and mm -hmm. Pokemon as well. Um, but just like you, I've always been a handheld Nintendo player purely for the Pokemon games. So I love the Pokemon games. And it's what's made me so kind of gutted that they've kind of ended their handheld products and gone into the Switch. Even though the Switch is in itself a handheld product, I can't yeah. justify the amount of money they're charging for a handheld console just for Pokemon. <laughs> so for me, it's like my Pokemon days are over. <laughs> I... um. I did justify that purchase. I have a fucking uh, Pokemon <laughs> Let's Go Eevee let's go pikachu special edition switch and that was <laughs> so no it's it's um it's a franchise that's always sold those consoles to me i, I just i just kind of wish that they put a little bit more effort into their games at this stage because i am i am getting a little bit tired with um with pokemon and the, and the, the worst thing about it is that it it starts with from having to go at fifa fans 
because it's like, oh, you really, you buy the same game every year, but with little innovations. How sad is that? And they're like, yeah, but don't you like Pokemon? And it's like, I've got nothing. I've got nothing to come. <laughs> especially, <laughs> exactly. especially with Sword and Shield, because the amount of controversy which surrounded that has been absolutely atrocious if you was reading and hearing all about it. It was it was a solid experience. I really enjoyed my time in Pokemon Sword and Shield. But to to be a fan of, of something, you need to sort of uh, notice when there's there's flaws there. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. as much as I can say that I, I personally enjoyed it, I can absolutely see all of the criticism. Not nothing has sort of been exaggerated. And it, it's for someone who's not a super kind of Pokemon fan like myself and yourself, it, it's it's not worth that price tag. So like, I haven't it, played a Pokemon game since probably Ruby and Sapphire. So okay. because I've bought a Nintendo Switch for my mum for Christmas, I can guarantee on Christmas morning that I will be playing Pokemon Sword because it came with the game. Okay. So obviously you're trying to say like FIFA players, they're playing the same game. Is this literally identical to the original games? Or will, I get, like, or will I get satisfaction out of it because I haven't played it for so long? You'll, you'll get satisfaction get, out of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, you'll, you'll probably get some kind of nostalgia kick as well if you enjoyed playing it when you were younger because it yeah. literally oh, hasn't yeah, definitely. changed. You start, you start in a small town, you've got a rival and a mom, there's a professor named after a tree, there's monsters running around in the grass, you've got eight gyms to beat, there's an evil team, there's a legendary, and there's the Elite Four and the champion at the end, and, and it's never deviated from that, and when it has, it hasn't been so well received. Right. Um, I, be I believe the seventh generation, which was the Alola games, uh, Sun and Moon generation, yeah, Sun and Moon. they tried to do something a little bit different, but even even then, the uh, the trial captains in that game and the kahuna still acted as the elite four and gym leaders kind of de facto and then you had these kind of raid boss uh pokemon that were called the totem pokemon which was basically like a like a big chungus version of whatever kind of oh yes yeah, yeah. pokemon was in that area do you know what i mean and they well this one the, you've got you've got the gx's i think they're called isn't it in the one gigantamax yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, speaking of Pokemon, I remember a game, and I can't remember what platform it was. I'm going to say GameCube, where you Did played you as a member of. I think it was you played as a member of Team Rocket, and you had to go around stealing other game, uh, stealing another Coliseum. Program. Is that, that what it was? was Pokemon Coliseum, Coliseum, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, that was a great game. Yeah, you, you, you were you were a lovable, a lovable rogue that went round robbing. Robbing people's Pokemon off them, but it's it's not as dark as all that though, Dan, because these were bad guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's like, it's like it's like, it's I don't know. Like if someone was getting their cat to rob banks, and then I took <laughs> that cat away from them and didn't rob banks with it <laughs> and took it to the Pokemon Center instead. <laughs> the like, uh, it's these were bad guys, man. They're getting a better life with us. So yeah, I've I've robbed them, but like no, no, liberated. So you, you okay, liberated. so you're the Robin Hood of Pokemon trainers. <laughs> Essentially, yeah, yeah. Well, you steal from, you steal from pricks and give to yourself instead of <laughs> whatever Robin Hood did. <laughs> on a on a side note, man, when I, I went to Nottingham and they, they, they it's like you walk around that place for half an hour and it's like fucking shut up about Robin Hood. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's like I get it now. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's like that with York and Vikings, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jorvik, pronounce it right. <laughs> Jorvik. <laughs> Get fucked then. <laughs> um, but yeah, what I was gonna say is because we usually only do about hour and a half and or two hours, and we have reached hour and a half segments, and we've yet to talk about video games as art. So I don't want to be pushy, but shall we now for the next fifteen to thirty minutes just to wrap things up? Video games as art and people's kind of feelings behind that. Um, or their ideals. Is it art? Is it not art? Kind of, where do people stand with all of that? Do you want to Do you want to start, Jamie? Well, art's subjective. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, one one man's uh, masterpiece is going to look like another man's fucking piece of shit on the pavement, do you know what I mean? So it, it all depends on where you're coming at it from. Um, I have been moved to tears by games. I, I have been exhilarated by games I've, I've been angered multiple times by by games and um i feel like anything that um that can get those kind of visceral emotional reactions from me is is uh yeah definitely 
worthy of calling itself art, um, especially when you you look at something like Red Dead Redemption, which we were speaking about earlier. That that game is just as just as much art as any kind of movie I've ever seen in my life. Any kind of film, it's it it it, it moved me just as much. Um, but on the other side of that argument, you are always going to have sort of people that are never going to kind of dip their toe into the, into this world and, and we'll always see them as kind of like bloated bloated children's toys but uh, no I, I i definitely come down on the uh on the side of the spectrum that de definitely video games can be considered art 100 percent. no i i, I yeah. completely back and agree with that i always find it fucking wild when my parents are a perfect example of this, where they're like, you'll spend so many hours on video games. Why? What's the point? And it's like, well, you guys spend so many hours watching TV and movies. Like, TV and movies kind of argue with some TV shows. But once again, art is subjective, so that's probably just me being subjective about it. Um, it's the same thing. It's entertainment and art, and it's the same with video games. Yes, they're entertainment, but it's also art, and I'm sorry, but anyone turns around and says video games is for children, what sort of child fucking goes and... Oh, I'm going to say what sort of child goes and plays Grand Theft Auto 5, but we know a lot of children probably have played Grand Theft Auto 5. <laughs> we, <laughs> but, we did! We did! You had but, San Andreas when you were I a kid, was probably you? about 13 <laughs> when I got San Andreas. Going, going back to Nintendo 64, I'll never forget the one time when uh, I stayed around my mate's house. And uh, his, his mom came back with a copy of Conker's Bad Fur Day, oh. if anyone knows what the game is. Yes. And she's just like, oh, I've saw this game. It says it's 18 plus, but it's got a nice cute squeal, so I can't see what's wrong with it. So she gave us uh, Conker's Bad Fur Day to play for the evening. And let's just say poor eight-year-old me had my mind fucking blown by that shit. <laughs> what happened in it? Uh, don't tell him what, you what, have to play it, Russ. Happen. It's yeah, probably it one of the best it. games you'll ever fucking play. <laughs> oh, God. Basically, <laughs> you play as a squirrel. You know, you say that, and like, I'm going to point out a game which, <laughs> for that reason, is in my mind. Uh, oh, God. Leisure Suit Larry. Fuck off. <laughs> Leisure Suit Larry, Magna Cum Louder. <laughs> Fucking game, amazing game. Amazing I, I, game. It's the filthiest game I've ever fucking played. It's certainly a game. That game could not come out in today's market. No. Like, Definitely not. Like, Definitely yeah. not. I think I first played it for the Xbox 360. Uh and if anybody hasn't heard of it basically you play as a guy called Larry uh, Leisure Suit Larry uh, and I think you have to go around a university campus taking part in certain challenges and completing certain challenges to become uh, like eligible for this game show where you get to it's like a fucking sick um, version of Blind Date that is the sequel for the original ones were Sierra yeah, were point and click classics. It was two D and everything. Right, and that's okay. even worse because you're just playing as a sleaze bag or going to the bar trying to uh, get a one night stand, and that's what the whole entire game is about. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing that the essence of Larry. Oh yeah, like the, the one that I played, which was the one where you actually played as Leslie. Like it wasn't point and click. You could control every yeah. movement. Um, there are like full frontal sex scenes in that game <laughs> and it was just hilarious and i, I think I, I, considering it was an 18 plus game i think i was probably about 14 15 when i played it and i don't even i can't even remember where i got it from i really don't i can't remember but it was a fucking well, it, it was it a had, great game it had quite a um oh uh, oh he's lost jack he's oh no we've lost adam Oh no, he was the backbone of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it had quite a cartoonish um, art style, though, so I'm not, I'm not surprised that that kind of yeah. accidentally fell into your collection at 14 years old. Because it, it's 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 kind of, from what I remember of it, it's kind of like Mario 64, but with banging chicks. Do you, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like it's got that kind yeah, of pretty much 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, would you it's say that, very would you much say a that cartoon Leg comic game as well. Would you say that Leisure Suite Larry Magna Cum Laude is art? No. I think it was I mean, just a game made by perverts. <laughs> for the sake, of, though, for the sake that. of a bit of a laugh. I mean, with stuff like that, though, there is always... I remember someone talking about art when I went to college, and there was how, like, with everything that's made, or, like, it kind of falls into, like, three different categories. I remember one is, like, throwaway, and one is... I can't remember what the other one was called. But it was just, like, stuff like that would be classed as throwaway. It's just made for you to waste 30 minutes in it and fuck off. Whereas there's games like Red Dead Redemption are made to be art. They are put... There's a lot of love in those games. Whereas uh, then the other games like The oh. Last Duke Nukem is made because someone hates their mother. Yeah. Like, that's why these games are made. Some are made I don't, I don't know. Are. If you've ever played Postal 2, I consider Postal 2 to be art. That game's amazing. Some games are made for <laughs> art. And some games are made by artistics. Oh, sorry, autistic. Uh, I remember no, a game I as well. I, I think this would be classed as a throwaway game. PlayStation 2, it was called, it was called State of Emergency. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that. Yeah, yeah, it's a Japanese one, wasn't it? Was it? I don't, I'm be, not sure. I if think it was, it was Japanese because you played as a Japanese office worker, didn't you? Uh, no. If it's a game it was I'm a thinking of. Selection of three characters. One of them was a, a Hispanic, a short Hispanic guy. Uh, there was a black guy, and there was, I think, an Asian woman. And um, the entire, the entire aspect of the game was to go around and cause as much chaos as possible. And blow shit up. And yeah, I'm thinking of a different game. I do apologise. <laughs> but I think I know what game you're on about. Yeah. I, yeah. No, I um. I remember seeing this graphic in a in like a PlayStation magazine quite prominently, but I've never played the game in my life. I was just seeing if, if any. I've googled it to see if it triggers anything, but I I remember an advertisement for this game, published by Rockstar. That's interesting. Yeah, it was definitely a Ooh. Rockstar game because like you would pick up a machine gun and you'd walk into a mall. And you just massacre people. Like the Remember guys no was... <laughs> Yeah, no Russian. <laughs> in in Incredible Crisis is the game I was thinking of. I've just uh, googled it. I need to have a look at that because is that like a series of different, um, like kind of mini, mini games? games? Yeah. Like your Japanese office worker running away from running away from something down like the office halls. Um, it's it's all about being your stereotypical Japanese salary man. And you're on the uh, well edge of having a mental breakdown at every given moment, and you're going through a series of mini games not to have a mental breakdown at work. <laughs> what, what, what's what's the game called? Incredible Crisis. Uh, I yes, that. I remember this game. There was a level on this game where you had to you had, you went into a fucking Ferris wheel with a woman. And you had to make her come by the time you got round. What the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? You had to make her orgasm by the time it reached the back round to the bottom. <laughs> Such a fucking weird game. And I was probably about ten when I played that game. I was even younger. You Google Incredible Crisis and there's just this really happy Japanese salary man getting on a Ferris wheel with a woman. Yeah, that's the that's the game. I've, that's been, I've wondered what that game was for fucking years. <laughs> and you finally fucking... Oh, man. I remember that game. Vividly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is one of those experiences you never forget, man. Yeah. <laughs> finger, finger blasted in the Ferris wheel. <laughs> <laughs> and knuckles. Oh, man. <laughs> I did. Incredible. I wanted to. I wanted to sort of um, dovetail off something that Russell said about um, sort of video games being designed to be art. Um, and you use Red Dead Redemption as an example there, pal. I'm, I'm not entirely sure that rings true because I think the Red Dead Redemption is is designed to be an experience first and and sort of like art second. But when you go too far the other way where games are created to be art it, that just turns me off completely it's, it's why i've never played death stranding it's why i didn't care too much for the last of us part two because it's like this game is important look at how important this game is look how yeah. artful and creative this game is and it's like 
all I, I said it earlier, all flash, no gash, do you know what I mean? All style, no substance, just a very hollow experience. So I, I, I find that can be, do you know what I mean? When you're just beaten over the head with how important this game you're playing currently is, it's like, nope. it, just, it, just, it just comes off as pretentious and just turns me off to the whole experience where uh, Red Dead Redemption is artistic effortlessly and almost accidentally do you know what i mean it just yeah. tells a solid cohesive narrative in a gorgeous immersive world with shit loads of stuff to do uh, and it ends up being this it but uh, this artful game but it was never it was never set out to be that it was okay we're gonna tell the story of the vandalin gang what does that game look like whereas i can imagine the first pitch meeting with naughty dog for last of us part two it's like okay well we've got to be as diverse as possible and have this this um protagonist that's you know like a, a gay woman and we've got to we've got to really hit those players in the feels about how revenge is sort of like when you go out for revenge you've got to dig two graves and it's like no i'm not interested i'm not i, I don't I, I don't like it so much do you know what i mean that was my reaction i, I, to I, last I think of us too. I think this yep. is the perfect segue now into cyberpunk. So I don't Let's know how do much it. you know about cyberpunk. I could talk a lot of it without saying spoilers. Um, so cyberpunk itself is actually based off a pen and paper RPG game, similar to Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and at the time of its release, it was literally just seen as science, sci-fi science fiction. Um, and I think it was written back in the eighties. It was written and published back in the eighties. And the reason why it's so interesting, especially as a video game today, is the video game is very, very close and word I'm looking for. It's very close to its source material. Like they've, they've not skipped any detail. And what makes it so interesting is the source material was written in the 80s and it discusses a lot of social issues with what we're facing today. Um, which I think what works so well in Cyberpunk 2077 as a game, because you've pretty much in that game got a lot of social issues which we've got going on today, but it's been hyper exaggerated. But you can see where the origins are coming from. Like one of the big things in the game is all about how you don't own your identity. Your identity is sold to you by corporations. So you don't really make or form your own identity or anything like that. You're not unique. You're just forming an algorithm of everything available to you by different corporations, yet you try to claim it to be unique and the corporations try to play it off as you're being unique, even though really you're just acting exactly the same as everyone else and everything available to you is the same as everything else, which is obviously a hyper-exaggeration of what we have today with identity, which is everyone likes to think they've got their own identity when really you obsessed don't. It. It, yeah, and people are obsessed with it. Um, and one of the things they talk about in there as well, which is amazing, so they do a bit of a comparison where it talks a bit about how in the 1970s, um, if you was in the workplace with visible piercings or tattoos, you wouldn't be allowed a job. Having vibrant hair colors, you wouldn't be allowed a job. And what corporations did was they took those unique aspects of identity and instead owned the identity and sold the identity as part of your work uniform. So once where things like piercing, bright head, colour or tattoos would be your way of expressing yourself, companies now make you, say if you're working in a bar, they make you have a specific tattoo as a worker of that bar. Or if you're working for a certain hotel chain, they make you take specific cybernetic augmentations to now work as part of that hotel chain. And it's about how corporations have been able to corrupt everything to do with identity. And the only reason they was able to do that is because there was a society which was obsessed with identity, which links to where we are today, because we are a society obsessed with identity right now. There's just loads of different things on like that where it's a game with a lot of social commentary, but it's not intentional social commentary. It's just because it's being so close to its original source material from the 80s, which just so happened to kind of predict where we we're going to be in 40 years time. 
um, which has turned Cyberpunk into this weird kind of beautiful art form of a game of it's a thing of if we don't change things, our future is starting to look like what this game is. <laughs> And as you play that game, trust me, it's not a future you want to be living in. <laughs> well, I don't know, man. We've got we've got customizable uh, dick size and Keanu Reeves. I'd I'd live in that future. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I spoke about this to uh, Adam earlier, actually. And there's uh, <laughs> there is an article, like, and again, he said, don't trust the articles because there's a lot of lot like, stuff going around saying like, fake news stuff about the game and all this. <laughs> But, no, well, knowledge without mileage is bullshit. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, anybody, anybody could read a blog and say, oh, well, I don't like this game, but it sort of dilutes your point if you haven't played it yourself. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I've, I've heard and I've seen the screenshots, but the, the game's on its way any day now, and, and I'll, I'll be blasted. But apparently, I'll, I'll have if you but, yeah, choose the circumcised penis option, you can't have sex with anyone because they don't like it. <laughs> 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 that is an alleged uh, thing that can happen. Um, citation needed, but uh, it's like, it's like this has been a massive kickoff, hasn't there? By um, I won't say it's representative of a whole community, it's just gonna be those specific loud mouths who kick off about everything, no matter what, anyways. But loads oh, of yeah. people have been talking about how cyberpunk is a transphobic game because you can play as trans, and no one in the game cares that you're trans, and it's like. How's that transphobic? This is your first game where you can openly play as a trans person and you're in a society which accepts you for being trans. The reason why no one cares that you're trans in the game is because they accept that you're trans. Everything is fine. But people think it's a transphobic game because people don't acknowledge you for being trans. It just it's like, proves that it could be attention-seeking, that. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think that Otaku just bad. bitched about it. I hope that that's the case, that in 57 years from now that we've reached a point where you can be whatever you want, and you can love whoever you want, yeah. and, and nobody's going to care about it, do you know what I mean? And all, yeah. these, all these social justice warriors that kind of look for problems where there aren't problems to make an issue about it, they're going to have to get jobs, man. And that's going to be yeah. going to be a beautiful day for all of us, do you know what I mean? It's like, I really hope we get to that point as a society because I'm already there. I don't know about you. I could not give a fuck. Oh, I couldn't give a I fuck. Do not, I do not take time out of my day to hate on anyone because of what they choose to do with their life or or even something as pathetic as like the colour of their skin. I don't I don't take time out of my day to fucking hate on anyone for that. And I'm I'm hoping that the the world of cyberpunk where nobody sort of acknowledges it because it's so normal. That's and that goes back to what Welsh was saying. That's why here we go. So this this is this is a thing which has been making the rounds actually, um, oh. and this is from the original role play book, um, and it's actually quite an interesting one. So you got to remember this is written in the eighties, and what makes it interesting as well because a lot of people have tried to cry racism over this. Either the person who wrote this is African American, which is a real fun part about it, or um, there's Ooh, a section in the book about diversity and unity, oh. and how diversity unity kind of ends up allowing the corporations to do this huge buy over of everything and how diversity and unity pretty much weakens the society to the corporations, not to governments, to corporations. And um, yeah, the, the paragraph itself, it says diversity and unity. It is now accepted among his historical scholars that in the decades before the collapse, America suffered from the sickness of racism and cultural identity. Everyone wanted to be seen as special Every group had to be equal or preferably better than its neighbour and fought to protect its special rights. If anyone had something that someone else wanted, they were painted as racist, sexist, elitist or worse. The divisive me first attitude eventually tore the fabric of American culture apart and caused it to self-destruct in a fireball of competing ideologies, none of which truly recognised each other's val validity. Diversity led inexorably to anarchy. It's scary. That was written in the 80s. Isn't that chilling? That is chilling. That it's was written in the 80s. scary <laughs> how accurate that is today. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the reason why this game is so amazing, because they've kept so close to the source material, and the game proper captures that feeling from that paragraph as well. Um, if you have the game on PC... Um, on good old games, they actually give you a free copy of the uh, pen and paper source book. 
Oh, no That's way. So cool. Yeah, so you can That's actually cool. read that paragraph in itself in the book. Nice. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know it was like a pre-established uh, kind of IP that was getting a sort of like a second life. Oh yeah, yeah they, they... I, I, I assumed it was just ground up. They did they do that a lot because. Um, like the, the Witcher was a, a series of books, if, I, if I've got my facts correctly yeah. there. The series was a, a, game, yeah, so. I think it's a Polish author, because like all the all the um, lore and mythology surrounding the Witcher, I think, comes from local Polish uh, mythology and kind of urban legends and stuff like that. So that the CD Projekt Red, which is again another Polish company, decided to just turn all that kind of mythos into the game called The Witcher surrounding the books. So, Here we go, uh, Cyberpunk. Really um, first edition of the War Book was released in 1988. And second edition, which was called Cyberpunk 2020, so it's how he <laughs> thought we'd all be living in the year 2020, was released in 1990. <laughs> when they were right. <laughs> you know, it, it is semi correct, except we don't have all the cyber augmentation. And uh, oh, there probably isn't yeah. a pandemic in it either. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, they, they said they said that in the years before the collapse. Do you know what I mean? This well, could yeah, be true. this could be it, boys. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. We'll living through it. Cybernetic dick augmentations on the way, boys. Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nah, we won't be fucking doing a podcast then, will we? We'll I want a in the I want a fifteen-inch <laughs> fucking mega Remember, shot. Boys, Remember, boys, no circumcision. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I want a 15 inch mega slong with fucking laser pointer and everything, like, you know what I mean? Mate, if my dick can't melt someone's eyes out, I don't want to be in that future. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, um, it's, it's deepness and expressionism aside. Just as a game in itself, it's just absolutely amazing as well. Because you've got, uh, without giving away spoilers or anything like that, you've got all these, you get that full-on proper sense of all these different cultures and identities and everything like that. Um, you have like a religion of Buddhist monks who believe by having any form of augmentations, it stops them from going on the path of enlightenment. So you literally have like this tribe of Buddhists who try to avoid any form of cybernetic augmentation. Um, and it's brilliant because you've got like side stories where people try to fuck over these monks by forcing them to have cybernetic augmentations to try and fuck with them. Um, which in itself is a nice social commentary on how we treat quite a lot of modern religions today. We don't really try to appreciate what their religion is. We just are more interested in how we can fuck with them. <laughs> yeah. um, and you've got loads of other things. The gangs in it are really fucking interesting as well, because gangs are no different to corporations at that point. It's just corporations have more money than the gangs. And once again, you look at how corporations act today with how they bully people and silence people and what they do in courts to silence people. Once again, no different to fucking gangs. <laughs> so you know. Yeah, that's like fucking using the... Um... The Last of Us Two is another example. There was um, there was a point when the, a lot of the story details were were leaked and people were discussing it on YouTube videos. And Sony and Naughty Dog were out there acting like the fucking mafia and copyright striking images, like images from the official, you know, press material and people talking about these leaks. Do you know what I mean? So you are a hundred percent right that they do do that. Like even now, like it hasn't quite got to the point of organized crime, but there's there's definitely elements of it in, in modern practices of uh, especially well, big if, if they're using fear and intimidation to that's exactly um, it yeah fear and intimidation to uh, what would I use the words as to get their preferred outcome in a court of law surely that is isn't that classed as perjury it's or it's fear and intimidation like to it's fear and intimidation to control the public narrative as well. Do you know, in the, in yeah. the yeah. case that I'm using, do you know what I mean? It's it's fucked up, man. Oh, world's fucked up. I miss the nineties. It, it's it's fear <laughs> and intimidation within the lines of the law, so it's okay. 
Yeah, exactly. So it's not like it's it's like the contract says we haven't done anything wrong. It's like yeah, but you're still a piece of shit. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the ethics <laughs> behind that is the terrible. Law, the law said. The law says. The law says. It's like well, it's it's. I'm not asking the law. I'm asking you. Do you know what I mean? Are you being a shitbag right now? And the answer is yes. Spoiler alert. <laughs> I love spoiler alert as anything. Like when you're about to be like, insult him, it's like spoiler alert. You're a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> I do like that. Well, they, might well. not, they might not know. They might want to watch the, for themselves the season finale of I'm a cunt. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, would have, <laughs> I would have guessed it from the title personally, but hey, her. I mean, how he met your mother. Spoiler alert, at the end, he meets a mother who <laughs> fought it. <laughs> oh, I wonder how this is going to end. <laughs> Everybody died. <laughs> I remember um, about 2007, I think it was, there was a film coming out, like an autobiography, not an autobiography, it's like a biopic of... Uh, Princess Diana, and it was just called Diana, and I, I remember being like, "Oh yeah, spoiler alert, by the way." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah you, can edit, you, can edit, you can edit that one out, but like... no, no, it's staying in. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I don't exactly edit. I just throw it on. <laughs> no, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Ah, oh. last. This but... has been, this has been a laugh. I've, I've enjoyed this. So... It has, it has. It's it's a shame that we can't get you on for the Jard Cast Christmas party. By the way, listeners, yeah. perfectly tied. <laughs> I did not shoehorn. <laughs> <laughs> so la, sweet. La, 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 la. Podcast party. No, I'm watching. It will be good. Lots of laughing. <laughs> 20, yeah. 23rd, 23rd of December, we're doing our first ever live stream. What is it going to be? Lads, lads, lads. Drinks, drinks, drinks. Not to that extent. Uh, we've got a series of guests who are going to be joining us. We're going to be getting festive. Um, talking topics are not going to be planned. It is literally going to be... It's just going to be several shit. Yeah, it's going to be several hours of ourselves. And we're going to have multiple visitors dropping in and out as the stream goes along. Having drinks, having a conversation. And obviously the chat is going to be open and since it's all live streamed, you're going to be able to put whatever you want in the chat and communi communicate with us directly on the spot. And we'll all be able to talk back to you. And the whole idea is going to be, it's going to be just like a nice big Christmas party. Obviously, COVID has fucked us and we can't have a Christmas party. So, hey, let's have one on Twitch. Um, our Twitch is twitch.tv forward slash Jardcast. Links will be on the YouTube and on the description on Spotify and everything like that. If you have us on Instagram, which is at Jardcast, we're going to be spamming it on there as well. Get some drinks, join us, have a conversation. It'll be great. That's Definitely. me plugging for Christmas party over. Oh, shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm assuming we're going to wrap up and conclude. Uh, I've really enjoyed tonight's topic, actually. I was looking forward to this uh, talk. Uh, firstly, as well, I do want to actually apologise for the fact that there wasn't a video last week. Uh, sometimes life just gets in the way. I've been working so much over Christmas. Like, over this December, it's been a fucking nightmare. I, I'm, I'm lucky, really, because I'm on holiday at the moment, so it's just one of them. But I've really needed this tonight. It's been great. It really has. Yeah, it's been... It's been absolutely great. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on, Jamie. We, Thank we you don't, so much. We, we don't get much choice to talk to each of them, unfortunately, thanks to adulthood. But it has been great just to have these last two hours to have you on, actually have a weird kind of catch-up and chat shit about games as well. No, yeah, no, it's, been, it's been real, man. I, I, um, I'm not as, uh, I'm not as well-versed in it as you guys, so sorry if I've sort of, like, derailed and... No, I no, no it's, gone, it's, gone me, it's gone great. It's gone great. Yeah, awesome, man. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd love to come back. Just let me know when you when you want me, and I'll be there. So... Definitely. And before awesome. we finish up, where can people find you, Jamie? If you want them to find you, band boys and everything like that. I don't want. I don't want them to find. <laughs> I don't want them to find me. If you if you see my personal Instagram or see me in the street, please just just don't. Just leave me alone. Uh, <laughs> I meant most of your man. <laughs> I was gonna say, having said that, having said that though, um, you can find Ataka on. Uh, any social media go in think of a social media we've got it our handle is always uh, at ataka official uh, like i said we've got an album out called sleeping giants it's quite good um and yes so that's it from me sweet brilliant thank you very much jamie it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on it's been great ah. 
Yo, welcome, buddy. It's been lovely to see you. Want uh -huh. to see you. <laughs> be honoured you're our first ever guest as well which is nice and it's gone really well <laughs> it, can, it, can, it can only that's the good thing like you're setting the bar so low with me that we can only improve from here do you know what I mean like... yeah next week we've got that Epstein fellow one so we'll see how that goes so <laughs> no that guy. no we haven't his name's Efri Jepstein Efri <laughs> yeah, sorry Efri Jepstein <laughs> oh I know the fellow like big Fucking fake moustache, yeah, I know the guys. Okay. Big goggly and, uh, glasses as well. And we've also got uh, Hill Binton on as well. Good old <laughs> Hill Binton. Um... <laughs> oh, God. Video yeah. games! <laughs> Video games. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for listening to us. Uh, as always, normally I do the plugs at the start, but I've decided to do it at the end because I can. Um, once again, we're on YouTube, Spotify. We've got a link tree which has us on other platforms as well. Social media, at Jardcast on Instagram, on Facebook, just search up Jardcast. Twitter, we refuse to have that because it's a piece of shit. Yeah. Um, at More about like it. Twitter. <laughs> oh. There's. I won't go into it because we're wrapping up. There's been some spicy things happening on Twitter recently. So if anyone's interested in that, just look at recent Twitter censorships. We may talk about it in the upcoming podcast. So if you're interested in it, read up on it. Uh, we're not going to go into it now because that'll be another hour we're here. <laughs> just a quick one as well. There will only be the Christmas party next week. There won't be a video because we're having the break, aren't we? We're having a break over Christmas. Yeah. Um, I yeah, sure, okay. Yeah, because like <laughs> yeah. The, the Christmas party is on the Wednesday, and like I'm working on the Monday as well. So yeah. it's just it's going to be an absolute nightmare to get any content out for next week. So we're yeah. going to have a break next week, and then we should be back before the new year. Or yes. Yeah. Christmas party, 23rd of December, starting from 6 o'clock over on Twitch. If you're unable to join us for any reason, shame on you, but it will be uploaded on YouTube afterwards on the Friday, as always, with our usual uploads. Sweet. Awesome. Thank you for coming, guys. Enjoy. Uh, and we'll see you again. Bye. Till next time. Bye.